Um, welcome to our um, SIA seminar um, uh, again, once again. In this month we have uh, Wala Qise from um, the University of Oxford. Um, she's a PhD student there. She studies uh, neo-traditionalism and modernity and she's going to present to us on the subject of the Sufi retreat phenomenon. Uh, for you. So I'm just giving you guys a setting here. Okay, so Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Um, I just wanted to give a little bit of a background on the phenomenon that I call Sufi retreats, even though the term Sufi might be a bit ambivalent here. Firstly, historically, um, the beginnings started in the mid-90s with Sheikh Hanza Yusuf's uh, Rihla program. That Rihla program was semi-organized with uh, Sheikh Ibrahim Ose Effa, who's based in Liverpool. This retreat was held here in the UK, in Nottingham. And um, from then on, the Rihla program and other programs like it have become a sort of phenomenon in the West, whereby a lot of Musl young Muslims try to connect with their faith, connect with the tradition, by going to these retreats and spending a period of time. Sometimes it's a week, sometimes it's a month, sometimes it's a bit longer, um, and in different locations. But the retreat in the 90s was very different than the retreat these days. The retreat in the 90s was very intense. Dr. Aisha Subhani, who works with Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, said that it was very intense and in that it started in rundown hospitals in the UK where students cooked their own meals, they did their own laundry. But since then, the Rihla experience or the retreat experience has changed quite drastically. Only last year it was held in uh, Malaysia, in Malacca, in a five-star uh, hotel. So the experience has completely transformed and from then on it took a new life of its own. Um, and that also got the students talking. Although their main focus was spirituality, the topic of money and the retreats was always um, kind of lurking in, in the background. So whenever students were pushed to their limits, it would always come up, we paid this much to have this certain experience and we're not getting that fulfillment. So there's, always, there's, there's that element of you know, business transaction that lurks in the background but isn't there at the forefront. And within that space, students continue to be reflective about their, their positioning in it. So one of the students said, um, after talking about how she felt that she needs to reconnect in the, in the retreat, she criticized the retreat phenomenon or the retreat experience as being the latest fad so you have a lot of young people or a lot of Muslims um, who jump from one retreat to the other retreat trying to uh, accumulate spiritual experiences without actually enacting them in their daily lives. So students within that space are immersed in, in the ritual but also to a degree maintain a certain reflective um, mindset. So the term Sufi here could be a bit misleading. It could be a bit misleading in the sense that the retreats don't actually say that they're Sufi retreats. That's not the main element. The main aspect or the main claim is a, a reconnection to the Islamic tradition that's been either marginalized or completely ruptured by modernity. So within these retreats, uh, the students go to learn or reconnect with the Islamic tradition in many forms, not only in terms of classes and the material that they, they study, but also in terms of 
the way they, they dress, the manner in which they study. Um, so this concern with a return to the tradition is at the foremost. And the Sufi element comes, comes into the conversation when we talk about tasawwuf being the spirit of Islam traditionally. So in that sense, it's a drive towards orthodoxy, but at the same time, it's a drive towards finding the spirit of Islam that's somehow lost by modernity. Also, the term Sufi could be elusive in another way, that these retreats that I, uh, that I base my field work on do not have a strict tariqa affiliation. So they might use the awrad of the Ba'alawi tariqa, or they might use the, uh, the awrad of certain Shadili shiyukh, but they're not particularly within a specific uh, tariqa. And the way that that could be different from other retreats which are based on a specific tariqa is that there isn't, the students don't come in with an already established form of community sense or an established idea of what their spirituality and what spiritual solidarity means. They come to develop it, they come to develop this culture later on. Whether, I mean, some students do, some students feel marginalized by the whole experience and don't feel like they fit in completely. Now, the word, the, the notion of neo-traditionalism, which is the, the word I use in my own research, uh, traditional shiyukh or traditional networks, which um, another academic, uh, Dr. Sadiq Hamid, uses, and al-madrasa al-asila, which is a new term that uh, I discovered when I was doing my field work. Now, the defining feature of neo-traditionalism or traditionalism, in a sense, is this contention that modernity has destroyed certain methodological uh, aspects of the religion that organized it and made it uh, complete and uh, made sense, essentially, made it logical in a way. It, it gave it a balance. And in a sense, that lies on the notion of um, following a specific uh, school of fiqh, and uh, not sort of moving in between, uh, either following the Ash'ari or the Maturidi uh, school of theology, and sort of an affiliation to Tasawwuf in a, in, in a way. I mean, in these spaces, they do not, although they do um, stress on the importance of finding a sheikh in order to guide your spirituality, they don't. Uh, say that you know, a tariqa affiliation is a deal breaker when it comes to tasawwuf. So you need a sheikh, but you don't necessarily need to be a part of a tariqa. But they say that prior to modernity, that has been no the normative practice in Islam. So that sort of methodological organization of tradition is the base premise on which the whole, um, the whole system of knowledge in, in these retreats are based. Also, alongside this assertion of that this is the tradition, <coughs> there is a critique of the modern condition. And like here I need to uh, um, sort of s have a disclaimer. So I'm going to talk about modernity in, in, a dif in two different ways. So I'm going to talk about what the shiyukh or what mid, what has been sort of communicated as modernity in these spaces, but also I'm going to talk about how the students interact with their modern context. But because modernity is seen as a negative thing, often when people often when we talk about modernity in this context, it is used as a sort of pejorative term in a sense that you cannot be authentic and modern at the same time. But that leaves a sort of space where, okay, we as Muslims exist within this modern context and everyone has been affected by modernity in one way or another. So if we do enact uh, our spirituality in modern forms or we do use certain modern things, does that invalidate or make our Islam less authentic. Now, I don't claim that, but some people do. Okay, so 
a rejection of mo uh, of uh, modernism as an ideology and also and as a sort of overarching paradigm and also um, a sort of critique of other religious trends that are kind of prominent in the Muslim community so uh, especially the Salafi trend in the way that um, it deconstructs methodology hollows out or they assume or they claim a hollow, a hollows out spirituality so it leaves you sort of spiritually empty and yeah so in the Spring Lodge retreat this was a retreat held a three-day retreat held in, Not in the University of Nottingham uh, I attended and it brought together uh, Habib Ali Jifri, Habib Qadim Saqqaf and uh, Sheikh Abdurrahman Rahman Murabit Al Hajj and I was able to discuss my research with Habib Ali Jifri. So I, my, I, I spoke to him in Arabic, my in, the interview was in Arabic, and that kind of put me in, a, in an interesting place, because the notion of tradition is discussed in, in Western circles as though it's a completely agreed upon term, and we all know what is traditional, what's not traditional, or we assume we know. But in Arabic, it's different. Do you say taqlidi? Do you say turathi? Turathi being heritage, taqlid being sort of... Um, has specific theological implications, but not, does not necessarily always mean um, a sort of ideological critique of modernity in that sense. So I was stuck. I was like... Do, do, I, do I say al-madrasa al-turathiyya? Do I say al-madrasa al-taqlidiyya? And also, taqlid in the Arabic context, uh, you know, in the 20th century, does not have always a positive connotation. It assumes a certain uh, uh, lack of agency in trying to decipher what your, uh, what your theological stances are. And he felt that. He didn't like the term taqlidi. He didn't like the term... Uh, Turathi, because Turath could include anything. It could include, you know, um, the Mu'tazili tradition. It's a part of the Islamic Turath. But he doesn't adhere to that. So he said, you know what? It's called Al-Madrasa Al-Asila, the authentic school. And with that, it shows you an interesting aspect of traditionalism in, in the way it understands itself. It understands that it, it has a claim to, to authenticity, to the authentic uh, religious spirit and the authentic practice. So, um, yeah. And within that, there is, you know, all the, the way that this tradition is organized. So there are different types of retreats. The Rihla retreat, which um, started in the mid-90s, went to different places. It started off in, in the UK and it went to New Mexico. Uh, there was a time where it was in Fez. But since the mid-90s, till this day, except this year, this year is going to be held in Zaytuna College in the US, it's traditionally been situated in Muslim countries with certain, sp certain spiritual or perceived spiritual... Um, significance. So that, that's one type. There's the Zawiya retreat and that's in Spain in Rosales. Uh, Dr. Omar Farouk Abdullah uh, teaches there and other. Uh, there's the Ghazali retreat, uh, Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad's retreat. Uh, there's the Spring Lodge retreat. The Spring Lodge retreat um, is, uh, was the one that I attended that was situated in the University of Nottingham and then after it, there was the Trodden Path retreat and that was uh, in Wales. And then there's the Dawra, which is, uh, which is uh, the retreat. I don't know if you'd call it a retreat, but it's, it's a form of retreat that's situated in Yemen. A lot of Western students either go study, female students study in Dar al-Zahra, and male students study in Dar al-Mustafa under Ba'alawi Shiyukh. So for the most part, students come from the West. Some come from Arab, from Arab countries, but usually it ha it's an Anglofo uh, Anglophile kind of retreat where people where it's taught in English and there is a common culture of um, being situated with in a sort of Anglo-American context. 
Yeah. So in these retreats, the notion of tradition moves from just its theological implications and it becomes a sort of performed reality. And here I need to I need to make another disclaimer. When we talk about performance, there's also the, the hovering like inauthenticity claim around it. Whereas like if you perform your spirituality in one way or another, then it seems to be an inauthentic way of uh, of being religious. When that's not exactly the case, everyone performs their spirituality in one way or another. Everyone performs their identity. I mean. Like, for example, um, take the women of the Nation of Islam. The way that they wear their hijab would be very different than the way I wear my hijab. But that sort of gears them within a specific um, religious identity, religious community. So that's a form of performance as well. And it has nothing to do with um, sort of perceived right or wrong. So um, this is actually from a BBC documentary that I stumbled on, which was really interesting. Um, now, of course, it's sort of uh, edited in a way that makes it palatable to Western audiences, but you can kind of see certain connections between it or, uh, yeah, and the sort of anxieties some students have going into or trying to find these spiritual spaces. Millions of people living in our frenetic, stressful, materialistic world, life can sometimes feel a little empty. It's sad that we search for something. You know, that homeless home, you know, that we have to know. Everybody uh, wants to understand whether their life has a meaning. And I would like to know whether my life has a meaning or it is totally meaningless. Something's missing. I don't know, I don't know if it is religion, maybe it's something else, but I've tried everything else. <laughs> Abdullah Trabapin, a respected Muslim teacher and university lecturer, believes he has the answer. People are frantically looking for something in their lives, a sense of meaning, a sense of purpose. The problem is, is they don't know what they're looking for and they don't know how to find it. I believe that what they're looking for is the spiritual. And that... So I think this is a really interesting um, documentary and it does not n exactly um, sort of capture the Muslim spaces or the Muslim retreats but the premise remains the same that we inhabit this modern world and there's certain holes in our lives that are missing and so we try to find it in, in these sacralized spaces and you'll see that like I mean, I'm sure you've come across this notion that's becoming, you know, more and more popular in the West now, and a sort of something that happened from the 90s onwards. To be a seeker of knowledge, you know, you have students, you have young people who um, are sort of yearning to travel the Muslim world, yearning to go find the knowledge in places where, you know, um, go find you that no one knows about, find that pristine knowledge in the places where it's, it's held. So, um, and there's a whole culture that's organized around this. I mean, like a simple, a simple observation, for example, uh, a lot of students who are sort of seekers of knowledge in that sense would write English or Arabo-English Arab words with like all of the didactic marks, even text messages and stuff like that. So there's, a, there's this performance or this need to be authentically traditional and not make mistakes in that sense. So this is uh, uh, from the promo of Rihla. Uh, this is Sheikh Abdel Hakim Murad explaining um, the sort of crisis or no, he's explaining here why they chose uh, the location of Rihla. This was in Turkey. And we come here, why? Why not Grand Rapids? Why not Cambridge? Uh, academic conferences nowadays can be wherever they like. Quite often they have them at uh, 
Disney Land is because the hotel rooms are cheap. Why not? Congress on Byzantine history of Disney Land. There was one recently. The Muslim believes that place is significant because everything in the world is composed of the concatenation of Allah's purposes. Nothing is kind of randomized. So what's significant about here? What air do we breathe? What achievements have been accomplished here for Tawheed and what mistakes have been made? So I really wanted to bring this um, clip in so you guys can have a sort of mental image of how it feels to be in these spaces. Now, keep that image of Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad sat, um, you know, cross-legged and students around him. And um, just keep that in mind and think a bit about the space. So. In, in, that, in that space, in Turkey, he was uh, presenting a class, a commentary on, on his contentions. This is a book that he wrote, and he has several other contentions other than that book. And they're basically uh, little quotes, and he writes a commentary on them, very much like Ibn Ata'Allah's secondary aphorisms. And he, he begins by evoking the image of an airport. So he says, airports are portals that tell you nothing about the countries to which they belong. Modernity is so anxious about having a location, having a symbolic space, that it has to celebrate the nowhere land of late modernity and post-modernity. We are anxious. One of, our, one of the anxieties of modernity is not just what it means to be a man or a woman, but also what it means to be of a particular place. And so he frames this contention with, uh, in like late sociologist uh, Zygmunt Bauman's conception of liquid modernity. He continues to say, this liquid modernity has no stables, no fixed coordinates, fundamental things like family, like class, like nation, like language, neighborhood, things that gave people meaning are now all up for grabs. Now the students who are in this space, most of them are not familiar with Zygmunt Bauman, do not know what liquid modernity is. They're not entirely sure, but they can kind of feel what he's talking about. They, they came in with certain anxieties and he put words or put m organized them in specific meanings. And from that point, they begin to think, well, yeah, everything is up for grabs. There is no family anymore. There is no language. There is no nation. We're all in these spaces of in-betweenness. We're all in nowhere land. So you take this airport and you juxtapose it with the Rihla retreat, the Zawiya, which has infinite meaning, which everything has a symbolic meaning that directs it to tradition in one way to the past, but also there is sort of um, representations or God is always there. So when you're in that space, you become a part of the tradition, you become part of the sacralized space. So you, this, this emptiness, this meaninglessness um, sort of dissipates. So when I interviewed students, I interviewed students who went to different retreats, um, Rihla retreat, the Zawiya retreat, um, and I asked them about um, why they chose to go to these places. And I mean, before, before giving bullet points, I just want to read uh, two quotes from, from, from students that I interviewed. So one of them is an American student. She's of Sudanese Egyptian origin. She's a grad student uh, of anthropology at NYU. She says, <coughs> I was studying in the University of Virginia when Charlottesville was happening. You guys are familiar with what happened in uh, the white supremacist uh, sort of um, protests and stuff. A lot of students there were upper class Republicans. I felt so unsafe to speak. I felt so surrounded, so in my classes I just remained silent. 
I'm surrounded by people that can't even see me or won't acknowledge me. Now that I'm in grad school, I don't have that problem anymore, but I have another problem. You can't bring in your identity or your narrative into these spaces. You have to be a blank slate. Islam can only come in in so far that it, it represents a critical discourse, not a valid alternative. So I wanted to come here in Rihla before I got even deeper into grad school. I wanted to know what Islam has to say about the self, about human nature. I, want, I also wanted to cultivate friendships with like-minded people. Another one of my interviews, uh, interviewees uh, is uh, British. She's uh, of Arab Pakistani origin. And she explained the reason she went to Rihla 2017. She said, all these attacks that have been happening, especially in that period after the Grenfell tra tragedy, that entire pr period, something in me it was shook. There was a p there's a point where you become so exhausted. The terrorist attacks keep on happening and people reach conclusions, but you're just so tired. I'm exhausted by the narrative that, is that having to portray myself as a Muslim and to say that Islam has nothing to do with terrorism. So I needed a space where I can just be myself. So this is really interesting. And this doesn't um, in any way represent everyone's experiences. But there are two aspects to this. A feeling that you, you enter a space where you don't need to perform your identity. You can just be Muslim. And also, being so tired of a politically contentious reality where everything is just so sad. So you, you just want to be in that space where politics doesn't interfere in your everyday life, does not dictate your everyday life. But then what's interesting is within these spaces, politics does intrude. And it doesn't intrude just by the students, also by the shayukh where there's um, critical moments where they talk about Islamism, where they talk about revolutions, where they talk about protests, the adab of uh, dissent. And that makes a lot of people, especially in the post-Trump era, very anxious. So a lot of students were very critical of the spaces that they were in. But other reasons why students enter um, these spaces, uh, well, the first thing that I constantly hear is that um, they're kind of sick of other Islamic discourses, that they're sick of um, the sort of Salafi rigidity, that they want to find a new spiritual Islam that won't um, sort of regiment their life in, in such a way. But also, they want to find an authentic, orthodox Islam, which they believe is not be uh, is not exactly being uh, communicated to them or they don't feel like it's practiced within their communities it's either a more cultural islam um or uh, a form of like rigid uh, lowest common denominator islam that that that's the term they use and also this understanding that islam is simple that's something that they kind of rejected they, they, they said, um, a lot of them said that, you know, um, we study these intellectual topics in universities. We go so deep into our math and our sciences and our sociology and our economics. But Islam is always easy. They were there to find a more intellectual form of Islam, a more academic form of Islam that can, that they can sort of, interact with on that level. But what's interesting is, um, especially students that um, uh, that are in Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad's class, most of them, except perhaps two or three of my interviewees, said that they did not really understand what he said, that they, they, they liked his sort of intellect, intellect. they felt connected, but they just didn't understand what he was saying. And so they, they take on the, this knowledge, but also, and I think if I have time, I'll, I'll get back to, to this point, 
especially in rihla, the uh, routine is so rigid that you take so much information in in such a short period of time that you don't actually have time to ponder about what you think or what you believe and what you don't believe or what things actually mean. So what ends up happening is a lot of students um, become so impressed by the level of discourse that they don't, when you actually ask them what was said, they wouldn't, they wouldn't be able to tell you. So, sanctified spaces. <coughs> So these retreats are often held in secluded places, e uh, whether they be here in the UK, uh, the Trodden Path Retreat, or in Istanbul. I mean, even if they're in the middle of the city center, the space created around it is very, very um, secluded from the rest of society. You interact with only members of the retreat on the day-to-day. -day. You, you, you engage with the wider society in small uh, sort of periods of time, but it's the sense of you're in a sanctified space and you have no interact or you have very little interaction with modernity, or even your interaction with modernity um, becomes governed by the language that you learn within this space. So when a lot of the students went to Konya, they went to the mosque and they were talking about how uh, there was the language of adab, the language of love that they shared with the women in the mosque. But that was the level of it, that was the limit of it. They didn't really engage with the, um, the community outside to a wider degree. And that, that, that's significant in a way, in the sense that um, these spaces ultimately you are leaving modernity behind and you're immersing yourself in the tradition. So everything around you, the routine, the, the, the symbols, the language that is used, everything is directed towards this, uh, this sense of tradition. But also, it's this understanding that Islam was preserved in traditional secluded areas. It existed in the center in, uh, prior to modernity, but with modernity it was sort of shoved to the centers where uh, a few awliya, a few shuyukh preserved it, and we're now trying to get that uh, tradition from these, from these people. So what ends up happening, so like, if, if we look at the Western shuyukh, for example, the Western Sheikh, whether it be Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad, Dr. Omar, Sheikh Ibrahim Asiafa, they studied under these teachers that were in secluded areas in the Muslim world. And through that chain of transmission, they moved tradition with them to, to this context, to this Western context. Mm -hmm. So by virtue of these Sheikh, they become traditional in that sense, and they have that spirit that traditional sort of authority where uh, when students sort of learn from them it becomes an almost performative chain of transmission that moves not just through time but also in spaces so um, in Rihla you have western students and western shuyukh in an eastern context in a context of uh, the secluded space in the Muslim world that is untouched by modernity, that is untroubled by politics. Um, the Spring Lodge retreat where the Eastern Shiyukh would come, uh, you have um, you know, the Habaib and you have uh, Sheikh Abdurrahman with Murabit al-Hajj, um, and they become something from the East, from these spaces coming into our context in the West. And with that, with, with that charisma, um, a certain element, the space becomes sanctified by it. And you hear that quite a bit in a lot of uh, the discourse around the, the retreats, you know, that we're here, we feel the blessings of the shayyukh in this space, and we feel their presence, and the place is blessed by, by their presence. 
And then you have the, the Dora or uh, the Dora retreat where a lot of Western students go to Tarim, go to Yemen, go to these secluded spaces w- to, to study under the Habaib. And you have students who want to go to Mauritania. And there is from that this element of returning back to that space where, you know, tradition was preserved. But also there is an interesting point here, uh, which I witnessed quite a bit in my research, that students end up making, creating meanings that go beyond even the prescribed, um, the prescribed uh, thing of, like, the prescribed self-marketing of, of these retreats. So um, on the Trodden Path retreat, for example, uh, one of the students said that um, the tradition always existed in these, in these marginal spaces, in these uh, spaces outside modernity. And Wales is, some of, uh, is one of them. And we forget that the Sahaba traveled everywhere around the Muslim world and that there's a rumor perhaps that some Sahaba were buried in Wales and that it was sanctified by that area. But that all goes back to a sort of image that uh, was presented about the the retreat into these eastern mm-hmm. places. And I think most of the students refer back to Sheikh Hamza Yusuf's travels to Mauritania. So I'm going to play a little clip of what Sheikh Hamza Yusuf said about Mauritania and his and travels. this man and he had something that was different from even what these other people had and and looking at this man for me was like looking at somebody coming out of the seventh or eighth century and and I'm like who is this man and they tell me this is the son of one of the greatest scholars of the Sahara his name is Anwar al-Hajj I said this is the son I I want to meet the father so my heart suddenly becomes uh, just ignited with this desire to go and see this man. And I set out on that journey. Here's this American kid from Marin County in Northern California, in the middle of the Saharan Desert. And here's this sheikh. And this is the divested man. This is the man who has, he has, he's given up the world. He is in a state of complete submission. One of the first things that he said to me after I met him, he said, tell me about your dream. And I had had this really extraordinary dream, and the dream was this meeting. The desert people of Mauritania are, they're, they're almost halfway in the unseen world. Their, their dreams are so extraordinary. I mean, we know this about Aboriginal people. That they're very connected to the dream world, to the Adam al it's called in Arabic, the imaginal world. And I'm seeing this in these people. Okay, so this is one of the questions that I ask students often in, in these retreats. If you were to study somewhere in the Muslim world, where would you go? Or if you were to study Islam, where would you want to do that? Because I left the space of, of like choosing institutions in the West. But the three, uh, three countries often came up. Syria, if the war wasn't happening, and Yemen, and Mauritania. And one of the students explained, explained why, these, why these countries he said, all over the Muslim world, you can 
you can see that the proper Islamic tradition has been marginalized partly by ultra-conservative regimes or by communism like in Yemen where traditional Islamic scholarship was completely driven out. The continuum hasn't ceased, but it has become so inconspicuous. So you have these satellites in rural areas, in Mauritania, in Hadramaut, and in places in Syria. And though, in Syria, so it's in these rural areas and that these traditions become um, com are coming from, yeah, sorry. Uh, it's in these rural areas that, th that these communities on the fringe, uh, which were once on the center, are now on the fringes. And Sheikh Yahya Rodas, um, if you guys are familiar with him, he's, uh, he, he lectured, or he, he was present in a few of the Rahlas, and he teaches sometimes. Um, he said this about the, Yemen and Tarim. He says, the tradition, which is the essence of Islam, is intact only in small pockets of the Muslim world that were untouched by modernity. Places such as Damascus, Tarim, the villages in northwest Africa are the dwelling places of saints who have preserved Islam and where Islam will be revived from. And this was in, in his conversation, in his talk about uh, the miracles of Murabit al-Hajj. And so, yeah, and then he continues to say, sometimes you have to go to special places in the Muslim world, like Fez or Tarim, or many of these other beautiful pockets that still exist of traditional society. You go visit the righteous, you visit their graves, and understand that the awliya, that, the awl that through the awliya, uh, that the generosity of Allah is distributed on earth. And for that reason, the presence of, um, of awliya or the presence of blessed people sacralizes this space. And that's why one of the students believe or uh, kind of reaffirmed or reiterated the rumor that whales might have these blessed people buried because these spaces sort of develop a life of their own, they, they become a sort of a spatial rep representation of the tradition. Now within these retreats, um, there's always the critical voice, there's always the internal critique. Um, one of the students remarked that, you know, you have students who barely speak Arabic, who want to go to Yemen, who want to go to uh, Mauritania to study, and they'll go back. They'll come back with no knowledge at all. You learn your basics, and then you build up. So there is always a sort of um, there. The, there isn't a single narrative that comes out. There's the voice, and there's the counter voice. There's certain like even rumors that spread within these retreats about the charisma, about the karamat of the shiyukh have people who are very cynical about it within the space. Ooh. 10 minutes, oh wow. Okay. Um. So, yeah. Maybe this will be my last slide then. So, in the Spring Lodge Retreat, uh, you have Habib Qadim Saqaf, you have uh, Habib Ali Jifri, and then you have uh, a Western Sheikh who studied under the Shiyukh. Uh, you have the Shiyukh speaking about uh, religion, but also giving commentary on modernity, commentary on what it means to be a Western Muslim in Arabic. And then you have the, other, the, sh the Western Shiyukh, who are, shi uh, who are respected authorities in of themselves, translating for them. And then you have the audience receiving that. And in essence, it becomes a form of performance of, of the tradition, and you can almost see the sort of chain of transmission moving through space and, um, and in time, and essentially. So the Western Sheikh become a form of sanctified uh, bridges of tradition. And from that point, you, students, some students ultimately start making meanings out of what it means to be a sacred Western Sheikh. 
So um, there were several discussions or perhaps rumors of karamat within these spaces that spread, and um, they weren't they they w they spread amongst the students, not amongst the sort of shiyukh. A lot of the students believed that Dr. Omar Farouk Abdullah had uh, karamat, but this was actually uh, sort of reiterated by Habib Ali Jafri. He said that you know he believes that um, Dr. Omar has his ahwal. But another interesting um, rumor that spread, and I heard um, a few times, is that um, that the shiyukh. No, before I go to, to that point, I want to talk about. Uh, I, I want to mention one of the the way the way that Dr. Omar is perceived in in the space. So one of the female students that I interviewed, I asked her if she believed that Dr. Omar was from the awliya. She said, I personally think that he is a wali. I know that some people say that he is the khidr of our time. Uh, some teachers say that khidr was never killed off and that there's a khidr in every era. And then people say that, khid, uh, that Dr. Omar was the khidr of our era. And then she continued to say that um, I heard in Rihla that the student, that um, the teachers can read your mind. And I thought, oh my God, that's what she said. Uh, so when you, when you, when you sat, uh, I asked her, so when you sat, were you thinking if Sheikh Hamza was just tapping into your ideas? She laughed and said, yes, I was so frightened. <laughs> Clearly, I never knew that the teachers can tap into into your ideas, but it made perfect sense considering how our experiences with the shiyukh were. And I didn't know what to do, so before every class with Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, I would pray two rak'ah of nafil just to clear my head, so Allah would give me, <laughs> grant me honor in front of him. Now this is n like this is never corroborated by the shiyukh, but this is the sort of vibe or rumors that spread within these spaces to to have the sense that there is some other world, worldly sort of uh, intrusion within the space that things don't you don't you can't take things at face value that there is an unseen hand that moves all of our interactions within these spaces now there is also critical voices uh, one of the one of the students who actually um, ha had a very strong Sufi background, um, she was criticizing the young girls who look at the shiyukh and admire them to the level of celebrity, and she said, "These young girls walking around here saying, look at the nur emanating from the shiyukh's faces. That's not nur. That's a lack of vitamin D." <laughs> <laughs> so there's that as well. And then in these spaces, what I found really interesting was that uh, men and women perform the tradition quite differently. <coughs> now, as women, like as visib uh, visibly Muslim women, a lot of us wear the hijab outside. So I felt that m women did not feel the need to perform the tradition in that sense within these spaces that they wore their normal everyday clothes but the men usually wore a Moroccan jilaba and most of them did not come from North African backgrounds and it, it's that imagination that the place where the saints are this is what they wore North Africa so you, you'd see a lot of um, turbans a lot of Moroccan jilab is a lot of Mor Moroccan slippers that are performed especially by the men, uh, not so much by the women. And then there's people, uh, others from Middle Eastern backgrounds, Pakistani backgrounds, you don't see them wearing uh, the Arabic jalabiya or, you know, uh, or the shawar kameez. They always wear the Moroccan jilab. Um, Another interesting thing, the food in the Spring Lodge Retreat, not so much in Rihla, but the Spring Lodge Retreat marketed itself as a sort of reconnecting with the tradition on every level. So I went in expecting a sort of reconnection, and they said, you know, we will have 
uh, Sunnah food. We will, uh, uh, you know, there's the Futua program where they teach archery, horseback riding, based on the hadith. So we had porridge for breakfast, and I asked, uh, you know, had the Prophet ever had porridge? And then <laughs> they responded by, he lived in the desert, so they must have had grain. <laughs> okay, and I think this will be my last point. There's, there w when I interviewed men and women, uh, there, was, uh, there was slight differences. So I interviewed people within the retreats and sort of when I went back home um, in other in outside outside that traditional space in sort of modernity, <coughs> and the women often in the retreats spoke about the experiential element of 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 why they went to the retreats. They they talked about wanting to connect with spirituality, wanting to um, sort of find these shiur, and they talk they talked more about the sort of love that they feel for it. Uh, the men in the retreats um, often position themselves as cert not authorities in a sense, but they spoke with a lot more authority on what constitutes the traditional, what doesn't constitute the traditional, uh, how they position themselves uh, through the vis-a-vis uh, -vis the shiur. Uh, but when I interviewed the women and men outside that space, Generally, you found that the women spoke with much more authority on like intellectual trends. They spoke less about their personal traumas, their experiences, and more about, well, what do they think about politics? What do they think about you know, Sufism? What do they think about certain things outside the, the space? And men were more willing to open up about their personal experiences outside the space. So they, they, they spoke about you know, their family life, their, um, their parents, uh, their, their religious upbringing, how they felt marginalized by the community. So there was that disconnect, uh, which I thought was quite interesting. I think, I mean, I have other things, but I think that's enough. Yeah, thank you so much thank you. Um, for that enlightening, interesting talk. Um, I think we should open up for questions and have to, some discussion, uh, if possible. So I invite the audience um, to uh, ask any questions or to raise any points of interest in relation to the talk. Uh, yes, Sarah. Um, I just want to ask a lot of these people that you mentioned to begin with have a kind I haven't, but I think my, my the reason why I, I, I picked this trend um, is a part of a larger conversation on sort of Islamic belief and practice in the West. What leads Muslims to accept certain elements of religious practice, uh, take on specific discourses and not others? So. I, I think the point of anxiety, I think everyone faces these points of anxieties and I, I, I think what was interesting about it was how people who are at the start of their journey are interacting with a lot of information that is not only just religious information, that's also um, sort of social commentaries on, you know, on, on, on their life and how they relate that to their experience. So I mean I, I haven't I haven't um, I haven't done field work in any any Tariqa specific um, sort of group or a retreat, but I I, th I would assume that there will be elements uh, that you know there's a more solid identity, more solid belief system, but also even people with Tariqa affiliations they are immersed in this modern world, and that doesn't necessarily dictate everything that they do or the way that they perceive reality. I ha like I know people that follow uh, a, specific, a certain tariqa. You have members who are more like 
liberal politically or even in their social life and people who are ultra conservative you know so it's not necessarily like a make or break kind of thing Thank you for your talk. I just wanted to ask, um, how different is a Muslim retreat experience to, uh, from uh, uh, in the West? You know, there's Catholic retreats or Buddhists. There's a lot of um, sort of Eastern yeah. philosophy type of retreats coming up now in in Europe, in America, where people just want to get away from the hustle and bustle of, of modern life and just be in the in the like the countryside. You know, go to some nice house, eat nice, healthy food sit with people that are friendly and just uh, talk about religion, talk about anything, but just to get away from it. How, did, you have, did you ever visit any other faith retreats? I didn't, but I think um, I spoke to a few people, a few Muslims actually, who would go to um, Buddhist retreats, who would go to Hindu retreats. And I think within a segment of Muslims who, who go to um, Sufi retreats, there is an aspect of that and I was going to go into it um, this term comes up quite a bit spiritual shopping yes, okay. where spiritual yeah, spiritual tourism and a lot of the students have that with a very specific Muslim context I was sat in a circle of girls and they were talking about organizing their trips around which shiuch they wanted to see or if they if there's a sheikh here, there's a sheikh there. So I want to go to Morocco and maybe there is, you know, a zawiya there that I wanted to visit. So there's an element of this taking a break from modernity and then going back into it. Being in a sacralized space for a little bit because modernity is just the the day-to-day -day life. Of, it's just too hectic. You want to get away, take a shot of spirituality and go back into, you know, your daily routine. So there is an element of that. And is it mainly, uh, was it mainly young people that were taking part? No, the no, the, there was, uh, there were uh, people of all ages and um, there were people also that kind of moved between religious trends quite a bit. So in Rehla there was uh, uh, one woman mm -hmm. who <coughs> converted to Islam through the Nation of Islam and then sort of in the 90s where there was... Um, sort of move towards Sunni Orthodox Islam, she kind of felt that the Salafi trend was um, mo kind of marginalizing her voice and she felt more connected to the Sufi. So there, w there are people who kind of move in between and there are people who also move in between religious spaces. Um, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar, there are other retreats like, these retreats are not, not specifically a Sufi thing. There is, um, a sort of, I don't know if you could call it a retreat or a conference, but it is a form of retreat, a decolonial Islamic conference in, in Spain, and there is one, a critical Muslim studies one in South Africa. So one of the, the students that uh, was in Rehla actually kind of moved in between these spaces. And um, it was really interesting because the political discourse in, in Rehla was completely different than you, you know, the one you would have in, in Granada. But there is this element of we want to learn more about Islam, we want to accumulate more knowledge. So there is that move between different spaces. Theologically and philosophically driven, 
um, and how much do you think that's the case of expediency in, in terms of making these things a success? Mm -hmm. I, I think it's interesting when you look at different Islamic trends, everyone needs to refer to the past in some way to make 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 any claim of uh, any religious claim uh, in, in the present. So whether it's the Salafis, whether it's um, you know Islamists, there, there needs to be that point in the past. Now the interesting thing about the the sort of traditionalist slash neo-traditionalist trend is that they take of a specific um, sort of period or specific discourses within the Islamic past and construct a notion of orthodoxy around it. And the problem with that is it doesn't always work out in, 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 in the present in the way that they present it. So, for example, um, Saying that you know um, we're, we we follow a traditional methodology, and that is sort of like a deterrent to modernity. If we bring back you know uh, taqlid in that sense, then somehow uh, we will be immune from modernity. When you actually ask um, certain shiuch about certain uh, fatwas regarding the modern world, it's it's not. Th there is an element of taking on sort of modern ideas or modern methods in, into that frame. So it's never as clear cut in reality as it's presented discursively. I mean, there's two examples to that. One kind of lesser example, and then there's a bigger example. Um, uh, one of the students asked uh, one of the shuyukh about, you know, uh, interest in taking loans out. And he said, "Don't even, don't even think about it. Don't even think twice. You know, taking if if you need loans, then take loans, even if it's interest based. And I mean, there there is a sort of mediation between modernity, even if discursively, you know, we're very pro taqlid. Um, and then there's also, you know, um, things that are on sort of a wider frame. Uh, you have." Um, the Marrakesh Declaration, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with it, but it was a document that Sheikh bin Bayya wrote in, uh, about like the fiqh of minorities. And that's something that's not actually new in, in, in the Islamic context. I mean, you have Qaradawi who, who, who wrote, who, who developed also a fiqh of minorities. But the, that, that claim of being traditional isn't, is, is, isn't as <coughs> clear-cut discursively as it is um, in reality. I think it's l less theologically situated and more um, a sort of critique of our condition as sort of modern people. There's an element of theology, like theology is definitely an important element, but I think the framework that is used um, is more critical of our condition in the secular reality on our anxieties as modern people than it is about the specifics of um, sort of theolo the theological finer points. But I might be wrong. Yeah. Does that mean that you can um, my question is that um, why do Muslims uh, feel <coughs> the need to go to spiritual retreats um, when they can obtain their <laughs> I don't know how to answer that. <laughs> um, I mean, people obtain their spiritualities in so many ways. Uh, some people can't read Arabic. That's another thing, you know. Some people can't don't have access to the Quran. Um, some people read the Quran and don't feel spiritual. They need to be in a space. Um, and some people have just been disenchanted by by all of the other discourses on on Islam that they they, they, they face in their day to day life. So it, it's so many different things. Um, I have a question about the kind of people, so you know we're talking about 
these are clearly people who don't feel, well, it sounds like they don't feel spiritually fulfilled in their daily lives. So I was curious, kind of, um, what kind of backgrounds are, are they conservative, liberal, are they religious? Did they kind of, are they knowledgeable on, mm. on things or are they just going, you know, to get that spirituality and they're kind of like lay people? What, what was your, what was the kind of range of people going to these retreats? So there, there, there was actually quite um, a diverse group so you have people who study Islam uh, in, uh, in in Western academic settings and who are not very convinced of the Orientalist narratives and want to be grounded in a sort of normative Islamic tradition so they can sort of say well this is our Islamic belief this is our Islamic practice and they can have a sort of hold on that and then you have people um, who often face like personal life traumas and who want to find meaning in, th in the traumas that they face and so go into these spaces trying to get that meaning. And there's a lot of people who have just reverted to Islam, so you have a lot of reverts. Um, and then you have people who, are, who have been a part of the, the Sufi or the semi-Sufi community for quite some time and feel like, you know, this is just like another retreat that they're going to as part of like their, their religious studies. Um, they're often not, not conservative religiously, but the space is usually quite conservative. So in Rihla, uh, the hijab is like mandated. You cannot, you cannot wear a turban hijab, for example. You have to be completely covered in, in that sense. So even though people come in from like different backgrounds, that space becomes quite conservative. I, I, sorry, I just wanted to ask, uh, these retreats, are, are they permanent retreats? Because uh, you know, when you were talking, I was thinking of like Ajmer or Dada Darbar in Pakistan, you know, all the, these places where people who could go and get some kind of spiritual solace as well. Mm. But are people from the West going to Ajmer? No. no. They're imagining this, the spaces in... Uh, so, so they're looking for something like... Uh, something familiar but foreign. So there is this... Yeah, you have a lot of people who are... who come from sort of... M the background of Muslim countries but are born here. Mm. And they're kind of disenchanted with the religion that they grew up with from their parents and so they want to find they want to find an islam that is in these authentic spaces but is just quite different from what their parents practice um i think uh sadiq hamid has a, a new book or it was released last year uh, sufi salafis and islamists and he made the point that a lot of people uh, in in the UK who came f who come from Brelevi backgrounds are feel like they they they're going more within that trend of sort of neo traditionalism in the sense that they they feel that somehow their parents islam is more cultural and they want to find like a more arabized form of islam but it's also very western so there's an interesting like imagining of orthodoxy and um, a sort of wanting to connect with it in a way that's familiar but foreign at the same time. I haven't read that one yet, but yeah, yeah I, I mean, I am familiar, but I haven't read it. You just want to check if she's familiar with it? Because she was talking about Western truth. Oh, okay. So these truth, though, they don't have popular. I mean, the, the Moral Between is where Dr. Omar Farouk Abdullah and Sheikh Hamza Yusuf started off, but. Um, Quite recently, Dr. Omar has sort of 
uh, alluded to the fact that he he was quite disenchanted with the with the group in a very um, in a very final way. So um, the 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 but I, and also like the discourses in these spaces are are different, but they there are sort of commonalities. I haven't really researched too much into the moral between, but there are people who have. I'm not. Sh I can't remember her name, but there was a girl at SOAS who just submitted her thesis. So, I mean, from what you said, it seems as if uh, it seems to be kind of like implied that a lot of Western Muslims go to these retreats because they're hoping to kind of like, shall we say, get like a, a quick fix. Yeah. Um, my question is, if they go to this and you know. And they become disillusioned. What happens after that? They become disillusioned with that space. Yeah. Um, it's it's interesting. So there there are there are people who just fizzle out of it in a sense that they they have that strong identity going in, and then when they when especially especially now like uh, with with Donald Trump, with uh, the political contentious, you know, environment, you have a lot of people who don't don't feel like they're the the sort of the big claims about um, tradition and the sort of foundational elements of it doesn't really doesn't resonate uh, with the current moments and and their and their personal experiences as well. Yeah. So, um, quietest, yeah, I, like for example, in Rihla, Dr. Walid Mossad uh, spoke about Donald Trump, he spoke about Netanyahu, and he said, you know, there is an adab of dealing with these people, and that, you know, instead of making fun of Trump, why don't you make dua for him to become a Muslim, and that way everything will be fixed up. And you have, at the same time, you have people who had just come from America and, you know, uh, were at the protests in the airports with the Muslim ban. You have, um, you know, African-American students who just don't really see that the discourse on race actually fits within their personal experience. And so there, there are people who become very angry but kind of keep to themselves within these retreats. And then some people who sort of take a strong position on certain points, but then say, you know what, um, they went wrong there, but we can't discard all of their knowledge. So there's a sort of mediation between the discourse that's developed in these places and their real experiences in the outside world. But um, I haven't interviewed anyone who was completely, completely disillusioned. There were people who kind of mediated their realities with what they heard. <coughs> and some were angry about certain things. Like uh, one, of, one of the students, she's, she's actually quite interesting. Um, she is uh, from, West a from a West African background. She was raised in the US. Her parents were a part of the Nation of Islam. But she was raised in both Sunni spaces and nation spaces, so there was always a movement between these two um, religious beliefs and identities. And when, when the discourse on political activism, when the Shiuch spoke about political activism, she kind of reacted very, very negatively towards it. She said that it was even disrespectful at a certain point. But she then went on to say, you know, you have to take the good and leave the bad, and I'm still learning. So there is this element of like intellectual humility that goes into sort of, I'm starting off this path and there are things that I don't agree with. I'll leave that behind and I'll just continue on. I've got a question. Um, it's very hard to do prediction, but do you have any sense you know, given that okay, you've come from the 90s up till sort of today, so it's like probably maybe 20 years or 15 years you're kind of studying of, you know, of these retreats and the development. Do you, see a, do you see a direction that they're heading? Or anything that seems to be a trajectory or a tendency or, or 
what might lie ahead for these kind of this phenomenon in the sort of coming five or more years? Well, interestingly, there was um, I saw something a, a few weeks ago uh, where I'm not sure if I if I recall this correctly, but um, they they were developing an E class with uh, Shiyu from Mauritania in Mauritania. So there's this sort of marriage of the traditional and uh, the imagined traditional and, and the modern in a way where it leaves a gap. People are quite confused. And that's an, el an element that people kind of criticize. You know, you have students who take selfies with the shiuch and, you know, with the traditional shiuch. So you can't re like, this is a traditional space, but no one really leaves their modern self behind. So I think the more it develops, the more pe uh, that these intermingling of ideas will come in together. Um, now, on the issue of politics, I think it really depends on on how the Shi'us discourse kind of develops from this point forwards, and also like how the political situation in the U.S. continues. Uh, in, during the Obama period, I think it was easier to take a, a less sort of um, quietest stance, or like even the quietest stance, people did not really react to it that badly because um, they didn't feel that push as much as they do now. So that that that's also something that um, will sort of impact on how how popular or unpopular it gets later because people are becoming more critical. Do you think that they will adapt or evolve in the light of that or do you think it will kind of collapse under these apparent contradictions or will it just kind of carry on but with these kind of weird, weird elements? I no, I, I think some, sh some shiuch will adapt, some shiuch won't. I think um, Sheikh Abdul Hakim Rod is really interesting in the sense that um, He's sort of in between. He, 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 he understands the political situation. He's very critical at some points. And then at other points, he uh, kind of criticizes political activism as well. So there is a sort of a more balanced approach. And that can give solace to some students. Sheikh Hamza Yusuf um, is a bit different. I think uh, especially, especially now, I think he's moving more and more towards a very quietist stance and um, especially in in this context in the sort of uh, post trump era that that that's making a lot of people more disillusioned with uh, with with him especially First time we've had, I think, full kind of multimedia um, <laughs> as well, which is, 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 and also um, our first female presenter at the at the at the